Assalamu alaikum and greetings to everyone. Today we are going to look at oblique shock waves. Unlike the normal shocks, the oblique shocks are oriented at slanted angles with respect to the incoming supersonic flow. This picture here shows the flow contours around a car moving at a supersonic speed. The contour shows multiple oblique shock waves produced at the front end and the back end of the car. These shocks are represented by the sharp boundaries between the green and yellow contours. Across the oblique shock, you can see the contour changes color immediately, from green to yellow, without any gradual transitions. The color changes could represent the flow Mach number, pressure, temperature, or other gas properties. I'll divide this chapter into four subtopics and will be covered in four separate video sessions. The first subtopic is the introduction, which is now being covered in this video, where we'll look at the context of where oblique shock happens in the real world. In the second subtopic, we'll formulate the equations and the procedures to solve problems on oblique shock waves. In the third subtopic, we'll look at how an oblique shock can reflect from a wall and produce another oblique shock. Finally, we'll see how two oblique shocks can collide with each other and interact to produce multiple shocks. It's actually quite similar to the reflected oblique shock case, but it's a bit more complicated in the sense that you have to use iterative methods to solve these shock interaction problems. In this slide, we can see three pictures of real supersonic objects punching through the sound barrier and producing these oblique shock waves. The oblique angle is especially steeper for the missile in the first image. You can relate between the oblique shock angle to the speed of the aircraft. Basically, the steeper the angle is, the faster the aircraft is moving. We can use a technique called Schlerin imaging to take photos of oblique shocks like this. The idea behind this technique is that the light will be refracted differently when they go through flows or any mediums with different densities. So when shock wave happens, the air density will change drastically across them. And lights will be refracted differently through these different air regions before and after the shock. That allows you to see the sharp lines of the shock waves. The orange and red colored photos here were taken by NASA on real supersonic aircrafts. These aircrafts fly crossing the sun in their background so that the camera can capture the sunlight and the refracted lights caused by the shock waves. They did these experiments to study sonic booms so they can design better supersonic aircrafts that don't produce loud sonic booms. You can see more about these NASA experiments in the two links I put at the bottom of the slide. The top one links a cool video explaining about the basics behind Schlerin imaging. The second one links to a TED ad video that explains quite well how sonic boom happens. In the next slide, we can see a simulation of an oblique shock wave on a simple wedge. The first contour boundary between orange and green here indicates an oblique shock wave. The contour plots the Mach number of the flow and it shows that across the shock, the flow speed drops from a Mach number of 2 to about 1.7. Usually, a supersonic flow crossing a normal shock would drop its speed to a subsonic speed. But, if the shock is oblique, the drop in its velocity is not too big and the downstream flow can still be supersonic. Why is that? We'll cover this in our next video. If we continue with the flow, we can see that it's changing its contour color from green to red. The red plot indicates the flow increases its speed to about a mark of 2.3 even higher than that of the free stream flow. The boundary between green and red is called an expansion wave, but we'll cover this in a different chapter later. So, what really happens that causes an oblique shock to occur? Let's look at the basic dynamics of it. Here, we have a simple wedge with a slanted surface, and it's facing a supersonic flow that's coming towards it. What happens next? Here's a simple sequence of what will happen. First, the wedge obstructs the flow and causes it to deflect. The deflected flow will obviously run parallel to the slanted surface. But, a supersonic flow cannot simply change direction just like that. It simply can't because its speed of sound is slower than the flow speed itself. I.e., there's no signal coming back upstream telling the flow there's an obstacle in front of it. For the flow to change direction, it has to cross a shock wave. In this case, the shock is slanted at some angle hence the name oblique shock. Also, across a shock, 
the flow speed will drop instantaneously. So that's pretty much the essence of what happens around an oblique shock wave. In other words, this is basically the aerodynamics of the oblique shock. But some questions we may have are, what's the new speed of the deflected flow across the shock? What is the angle of the oblique shock? How is that related to the deflected angle of the flow? And is it going to change the flow properties? Okay, we'll discuss more about this later. Another question is, where do we apply this knowledge on oblique shocks? We've seen that they can occur on supersonic aircrafts and on deflected surfaces, for example, inside supersonic scramjet engines for jet aircrafts and also inside rocket nozzles. But before we answer these questions, we need to generalize these problems into simpler geometries. The main reason to do this is so that we can create formulations that can be applied in many cases. One way to do this is to reduce these real cases into two common geometries. One as a wedge and two as a sharp corner. With these two simple geometries, we can apply them in many types of real cases. So that's all that we have for the intro section. In our next session, we'll go through the strategies on how to formulate the equations to solve these problems. Till then, bye!